So Washington was a proud man. He sometimes was an arrogant man, but he was very aware of his own shortcomings and which knowledge and background he didn't have. And he was very quick to surround himself with people who could fill those gaps and provide feedback or a perspective that he desperately needed to make the very best choice possible. That was our guest, Dr. Lindsay Travinsky, who joined us to talk about her book, The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution. I'm Mark Lawrence, director of the LBJ Presidential Library. And I'm Mark Updegrove, president and CEO of the LBJ Foundation. And this is With the Bark Off. When we think of how our presidents make decisions, we often imagine them sitting around conference tables with their cabinet secretaries, engaging in detailed deliberation and weighing competing points of view. But where did this practice come from? Where did the cabinet originate? And why does it function as it does? Lindsay Travinsky, a scholar of 18th century America and the U.S. presidency, is among the first historians to delve deeply into these questions. A senior fellow at the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University, Lindsay has published in The Wall Street Journal, Ms. Magazine, CNN, The Washington Post, and USA Today. She joined me to talk about her writing on the early American presidency. Lindsay, thanks so much for being with me today to talk about your fascinating work on the history of the cabinet. Now, there are obviously a whole lot of books about the American presidency, but I think yours might be one of the very few that zeroes in on this particular subject, the cabinet, how it functions, how it came to be. And let me ask you to get things rolling. How important is the cabinet, if you look across the long flow of American history, to the effectiveness of a president? Well, thank you so much for having me. And you're right, there really aren't very many books on the cabinet. So I was happy to start to to fill that gap. It is, the cabinet is absolutely essential to understanding the presidency and to a successful administration. When we think about any presidency, all of the big events have something to do with the cabinet, whether it's the secretary of the treasury, if we're talking about financial legislation, whether it's a war, we're talking about the Department of Defense or the Department of War before that reorganization. So all of the big things happening have to do with the cabinet. And then the president themselves have to figure out how to manage this group of people that are often coming into office with different ideas maybe their own agendas, their own egos, they're used to being listened to, they probably think that they're right. And that task is incredibly difficult. So the management of a cabinet is actually what separates the really excellent presidents from the mediocre or quite terrible. So from the beginning, it seems to me, there was a recognition that the executive branch was simply too much for one person and that there had to be advisors sitting alongside the president. And yet what's what's striking uh, from your book is that there was no provision for a cabinet or any kind of advisory body in the Constitution. Why didn't the Constitution call for any sort of committee of advisors or what we now think of as the, the cabinet? That's right. The Constitution does not use the word cabinet, and that was quite intentional. The delegates to the Constitutional Convention explicitly rejected proposals for an advisory body, including one that looked almost identical to the cabinet that we ended up having. And that was because they were crafting this document just four years after the end of the Revolutionary War. And they were very much influenced by their experiences with the British government and the British version of the cabinet, which they had really blamed as the center for corruption and cronyism. And they were trying very hard to avoid recreating that system. They believed that the British cabinet lacked transparency. And so they were eager to create a system, a new executive that would have more transparency at the highest levels of government. And so they did try to do so in two ways. First, they really wanted the Senate to serve as a council of foreign affairs. So that advise and consent piece in the Constitution, they meant that quite literally. They wanted the Senate to advise on foreign policy. And that's kind of ridiculous to us today because 100 people would be a terrible meeting to get advice from. 
But at the time, in 1789, when Washington took office, there were only 22 senators seated. So it's a little bit more reasonable when you think about the scope and scale of the Senate at that point. And the second piece was they wanted the department secretaries, because everyone acknowledged, even though they hadn't been created yet, there would be secretaries that helped the president manage these many and various responsibilities. They wanted the secretaries to provide advice in writing so that it would be very clear about who said what and who advocated which policy and who to hold responsible for any decision, good or bad. Talk a little more about that aversion in the earliest days to the notion of a cabinet. Why was it that so many Americans looked at this committee of advisors as a dangerous thing? Um, and in fact, many Amer- American revolutionaries, of course, saw the king as potentially their ally, but the the aides who surrounded him as the core of their problem. Well, that's just right. And I think a lot of their concern came from a lack of knowledge about who was in power, who had the king's ear, because all of these meetings took place in private. There weren't necessarily designated people who were appointed as the king's preferred advisor. There was this privy council that came from parliament, but it wasn't really clear who was on the inside and who was on the outs at any given moment. And it wasn't clear who they should blame. And so that was really, I think, the crux of the situation is they didn't know who was saying what. And they hoped desperately, at least initially, that the king might step in and support the colonies, stand up for the colonies' rights. Of course, that didn't happen, and he eventually got his fair share of blame too. But there was this sense that because many of the counselors came from parliament, many of them had inherited their positions and their wealth, there seemed to be a lot of corruption and cronyism, and they couldn't quite figure out why or where it was coming from or who was to blame. And so they really wanted to create a system where the answers to those questions would be much more readily available for any American citizen. Some of the framers of the Constitution, as you describe in your book, had various ideas for how to create an advisory body. What were some of the ideas that they considered before discarding them in favor of the two mechanisms that you discussed a few minutes ago? So lots of different options were discussed. One of the ones that, of course, ended up being most similar to what we received was put forth by Charles Coatsworth Pinckney. And that was the that the executive department secretaries would sit on a council with the chief justice, the president's private secretary and the president and offer advice, but the president wouldn't be bound by that advice. And that part was important because many of the state governments at the time did have councils, but those councils were created by the legislature, they were paid by the legislature, and the governor was often obligated to consult with them and then follow their advice. So it really undermined any sense of independent executive authority. So they really didn't want to recreate that. But some people felt that that actually was maybe okay. So George Mason was an opponent of a strong executive. He was very worried about this notion that there would be this group that would be responsible to the president and the president only. He was very worried about presidential authority because, again, this was only four years after the end of the revolution. So they had just won a victory against Mm -hmm. the king. And he wasn't particularly eager to recreate a strong executive. And so he thought it would be really important and really helpful to have a council that could help the president make decisions or maybe force the president to make good decisions if that person wasn't particularly inclined to do so. And he had favored a couple of different constructions, including members of a court, members of the Senate, members of an executive branch. But all of those ideas were struck down and rejected. So you give George Washington really the credit for establishing the modern cabinet. Talk about how George Washington sorted through his options and came to his idea of how the cabinet should function and how he should interact with his advisors. Well, Washington initially really intended to follow the descriptions laid out in the Constitution. It's very important to remember that he was the president of the Constitutional Convention. He was there for every single session. He didn't miss a single day's work. He also often socialized with the other delegates afterwards. So he had a very clear sense of what the expectations were for the first president and fully intended to comply with them. 
So initially, he started exchanging written correspondence with the acting department secretaries, but he realized that writing things out by, at this point, they weren't even, you know, with a ballpoint pen, they literally had a quill and parchment. It's an incredibly cumbersome process, and then you have to wait for that letter to be hand-delivered, you have to wait for the response to come back to you, and then what happens if you have follow-up questions, or you disagree about something, or you want to do edits? This process was very slow, it was very inefficient, and there was so much on his plate that he couldn't afford to conduct all of that business in writing. So he started to experiment with this choice where he would send a letter and maybe the secretary would send a letter back, but then would bring it in person and they would have a one-on-one -on -one consultation. So there was still a record of what they were discussing, but they could hammer out any of the details face-to-face, -face, have those conversations, figure out next steps in a much more productive and efficient way. So that worked for about two and a half years. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, he also tried to experiment with some of these other options that were laid out. He did indeed go to visit with the Senate to get their advice on foreign policy. He set up his first visit in August of 1789, just a couple of months after his inauguration. And he wanted to talk about an upcoming peace commission that he was sending diplomats to to try and negotiate a peaceful settlement between North Carolina, South Carolina, and several Native nations. He had never done so before, so he wanted the Senate's advice, and he sent them all of the materials he could possibly think of to help them prepare to make sure that they would be able to give thoughtful, reasonable advice when he asked questions. And it went terribly. They didn't want to talk to him. They wanted to refer it to committee. They wanted to discuss it privately. And he was furious because he wanted that give and take. He wanted that sort of exchange that would allow him to come up with different solutions and see the different points of view, see the different possibilities. So he declared that it was a total waste of his time. He reportedly said on the way out of the room that he would never again return for advice, and he never again returned for advice, and no president since has ever gone to the Senate for advice. So it's pretty remarkable that just a couple of months after Washington took office, this key part of the Constitution had proven to be wildly ineffective when mm. faced with the demands of day-to-day -day governing. Now, in this early period, there were only a very small number of cabinet-level departments, Treasury, Foreign Affairs. I'll leave it to you to tell us what others there were, but talk a little bit about how this institution grew over time as the size and complexity of the federal government expanded. That's right. There were only four advisors initially. So it was the Secretary of War, who was Henry Knox, was the first official Secretary of War. Secretary of State, which was Thomas Jefferson. Secretary of Treasury was Alexander Hamilton. And then the Attorney General was Edmund Randolph. The Attorney General did not have a Department of Justice until 1870. So until that point, it was really a constitutional advisor to the administration, the other cabinet secretaries, and the president. The cabinet has grown and evolved and continues to change, actually, I would argue to this day, based on the demands on the president and on demands of government. So the next position that was created after those four was the Secretary of the Navy. Makes sense. If you're going to have a Navy, you need someone overseeing it. And that was prompted by the need for national defense. There was a sort of undeclared war with France, and it was clear that the coastlines needed to be better defended. From there, the, the departments have expanded, they've been shifted, they've been moved around. Typically, we see creations when there's a new responsibility taken on by the federal government. So there were new departments created during the New Deal and in the 1950s and 60s as the federal government was taking on some responsibilities that it hadn't before. Or we see a, a shift or an organization after a climactic moment. So after World War II, there was a reorganization of what we would consider to be sort of the war and defense departments. There's no longer a Department of War. There's a Department of Defense and the Department of Navy, Army, Air Force are underneath that umbrella. We also saw a reorganization of intelligence agencies and sort of what we would think of as security agencies after 9-11, which makes sense. There's this very traumatic moment, kind of need to think about how to prevent one of those in the future. 
Congress creates all departments. So if there's going to be a new department, that is Congress's responsibility. Although I will say President Dwight Eisenhower kind of tried to fudge that. And so Congress <laughs> made very clear that only they can create new departments. However, a president can decide what is a cabinet level position and what is not. So for example, the CIA director sometimes has a cabinet level position and sometimes isn't. Presidents can decide if they have certain pet projects or certain things that are really important to them. They can nominate an envoy. That is a cabinet level position, which usually designates a certain amount of seriousness and funding for that particular cause. Now, going back to Washington for just a minute before we get into later periods of American history, you credit Washington, as many historians do, with establishing any number of really important precedents that continue really to shape decision making to this day. Say a little, if you would, about how George Washington went about choosing members of his cabinet and um, what he had in mind in making the selections that he did. One of the most underappreciated elements of Washington's presidency, I think, is just how much he had to do from scratch. There was no model. There was nothing written down. There's nothing to follow. And so he knew that every single action was going to establish a precedent or a model for the people that came after him to follow. And therefore, every single decision carried this incredible burden and weight. And he felt that if he made any decision incorrectly, the nation might fail, which sounds a bit hyperbolic from the perspective of the 21st century when we know, in fact, the nation did not fail. But at the time, they had good reason to think that maybe it wouldn't go so well. They, this was the time of the French Revolution when the French Republic was failing spectacularly. So he was very anxious and rightfully so. And he came up with a couple of important factors or qualifications that he was looking for anytime he appointed a cabinet secretary or frankly, even any national level official. So first, he had to know them. He had to trust them, which makes sense. If you're going to take advice from someone, it's helpful if it's advice that you trust is, is well-intentioned. Second, he wanted to make sure that they had expertise and knowledge that was different than his own. So Washington was a proud man. He sometimes was an arrogant man, but he was very aware of his own shortcomings and which knowledge and background he didn't have. And he was very quick to surround himself with people who could fill those gaps and provide feedback or a perspective that he desperately needed to make the very best choice possible. So for example, he understood Alexander Hamilton's financial plans, but he wasn't a particularly savvy or creative financial planner himself. So it was really essential as the country was going through this huge economic burden to come up with a, a plan to help the economy recover from the war. And Hamilton could do that. Similarly, Washington had only left the country once. It was to Barbados when he was a teenager. He had never been to France or England or Spain. And he also didn't speak French, which was the language of diplomacy at the time. So it was pretty important to have a secretary of state who was a diplomatically experienced person who had been to these places, understood how foreign courts worked, and could actually speak the language, which Thomas Jefferson did. The final thing that he was very concerned about was making sure that the cabinet represented the entire nation, or I should really say represented all types of citizens, which actually meant all white men. Women, people of color, and even some indigent white men were not really considered citizens and so were not potential candidates for this candidate pool. Washington was very aware that the states had few emotional ties between them and had almost no emotional ties to the new federal government. And so the cabinet was an excellent opportunity to try and foster some of that goodwill and foster those connections. And one way to do that was to ensure that different types of the American experience were represented in the administration. So people felt that their voice was heard or at least their perspective was understood. So Henry Knox, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, they came from different parts of the country. They represented different cultural, educational, religious, economic factions, and therefore spoke to the different walks of life in the United States. And that was essential and something his contemporaries very much understood. And the best presidents since Washington have replicated that process. Your research clearly shows that George Washington was in the driver's, driver's seat in shaping the cabinet 
But it also shows that the cabinet, in turn, could sometimes be quite influential in shaping George Washington's decisions. Can you give us any examples that sort of bear out the importance of the cabinet in determining how we think about the Washington administration and some of those precedents that were established in the early days? Gosh, there are so many because Washington rarely went to a cabinet meeting with his mind made up. He genuinely wanted to hear what his advisors had to say, and then he would try and make the best decision possible from that informed place. But one example that I like in particular, and it's because it is such a relevant story for today, is the first time that Washington asserted executive privilege. Congress had actually asked for documents and had asked for information from almost the very beginning of Washington's presidency, starting in 1791. And Washington gathered his cabinet and he said, first, does Congress have the right to do this? Because again, the Constitution doesn't really say a whole lot about how the president and Congress are supposed to interact. And the cabinet said, yes, we do think that Congress has the right to ask for information. We also think you have the right to refuse. In this circumstance, we don't think it makes sense for you to refuse. So Washington didn't. And he complied. He sent all the materials and moved forward. And he did so several times throughout his presidency. However, in 1796, the House of Representatives was debating the Jay Treaty, which John Jay had negotiated in 1794, because the House had to pass a bill that would create the funds in order to comply with the terms of the treaty. And this treaty was incredibly unpopular with certain segments of the population, including many of the Democratic Republicans in the House. And so they were trying to tank this treaty by any means necessary. And they decided one way to do it would be to ask for Washington's papers, all of the executive papers pertaining to this treaty, because they were convinced that George Washington and John Jay had really betrayed the interests of Southerners. And so they thought that they had the paperwork, they could prove it. So they requested all the paperwork. Washington gathered the cabinet. He asked what they should do. And they agreed unanimously that Washington should assert executive privilege for the first time, which he did decide to do. And his letter is spectacular. I highly encourage everyone to go read it online. It is available. He explains that he in general, believes very strongly in Congress's right to oversight in this particular interest, in this particular instance, because it was diplomacy, and diplomacy requires a level of secrecy that a lot of other issues don't. He was going to assert privilege because basically in in our language today, it was a national security issue. So the level of oversight and the level that Congress had to overcome in order to see these documents and to make them public is higher. However, he said, if this was an impeachment investigation, that would be a different matter because Congress's right to investigate in an impeachment inquiry is so much higher than just a standard inquiry that, of course, he would turn over the papers, which established two things. One, he was kind of daring them to impeach him, which they obviously were not going to do because that would have been ridiculous. And in fact, they did not. But it really established that there are different types of inquiries. There are different levels of secrecy. There are different things that Congress should do depending on the circumstance. Finally, he said, the House is not supposed to have a role in foreign policy. I was at the Constitutional Convention. I was there when we decided that the Senate would make foreign policy with the president. And you are trying to usurp constitutional duties that do not belong to you. And if you do not believe me, I have the journals from the convention sitting in the Department of State offices, and you are welcome to come look at them. And it is the ultimate mic drop gauntlet throw (laughs) moment. He's very sassy, and he's not usually sassy in his letters to Congress. So I think it's one of my favorite moments. So you've just drawn a really fascinating connection between something that happened in the Washington administration and an issue that continues to stir controversy today. I wonder in choosing to dive into the history of the Washington administration, how much were you driven by an interest in questions that do concern us in the 21st century? Oh, very much so. I really wasn't actually setting out to write a Washington book. I was setting out to write an Origins of the Cabinet book because I wanted to understand this institution that every president has and is very public and very visible, and yet no one really seems to talk about it, and it's certainly not in the Constitution, and so I was trying to figure out where it came from to maybe help me understand how it has developed over time. 
it just so turns out that it very much was developed as a creation of Washington. So I couldn't separate the two. But then once I started to study it, once I realized how central it was to his presidency and the presidents that followed, I kind of became obsessed that it's, I think, the best way to study a presidency because it does reveal so much about their goals, their relationships, their management, their leadership style in a way that you really can't get at through any other institution. So now moving back to the long flow of American history, let's talk about other presidents besides George Washington and how they went about managing their their cabinets. Who, in your opinion, was the, the best president at managing their cabinet? So I think there are probably three that I would say are the best, and they manage them all very differently. But it, And so it reveals the ways that, you know, not one size does not fit all when it comes to cabinet leadership. Jefferson actually had a remarkably effective cabinet. He had learned from his experience in Washington's administration. He and Alexander Hamilton used to squabble constantly. In fact, he described cabinet meetings as a cockfight, which definitely brings to mind sort of a bloody feather flying spectacle. And he did not want any part of that in his administration. So he only convened a cabinet meeting when he felt that it would be productive, when he felt that the secretaries would get along. And he never convened a cabinet meeting unless he knew ahead of time what they were going to say. So he was very intentional about those relationships, those conversations, and it worked really well. The cabinet was very loyal to him and had shockingly little turnover. So that was one example of a very effective cabinet. Abraham Lincoln, of course, had his team of rivals. Now, I should say every president up until Lincoln basically had a team of rivals. That was that was standard political practice, that you would pick the very best of your party and put them in your administration. What made Lincoln so remarkable is that among his team of rivals, he was the least known and least experienced. And so he was coming to this place of power with no reason for them to really respect or trust him. And yet he was such a masterful political mind that he was able to build phenomenal relationships and actually manage the cabinet quite well. And he used his talent for humor, his warmth, his intellect to build those relationships and uh, had, a, had a really remarkable cabinet, which, of course, I, I think you've talked to Doris Kearns Goodwin about, and she, of course, has written the sort of standard text on his cabinet. The last one is, is one that one wouldn't necessarily think of, which is Franklin D. Roosevelt. Now, Franklin D. Roosevelt would not have been a particularly fun president to be in the cabinet for because he could be very manipulative. He often would give multiple secretaries the same task and set them against each other to see who could come up with a better solution. So he certainly did not prioritize cabinet harmony like Thomas Jefferson did. But he had a brilliant and widely productive cabinet. Um, And one of the things that I think he does so well that's so difficult to replicate is he actually sort of had two cabinet administrations. He had his pre-war cabinet and he had his war cabinet. And once it was clear that the United States was going to be at some point involved in World War II, he replaced most of the defensive positions with Republicans died in the wool Republicans that had served in previous Republican administrations, and they agreed on no social policy. They agreed on no economic policy, but they agreed on how to fight the war enough that they could have a bipartisan administration and it could be a unified war effort. Mm. That takes remarkable skill and was something that very few presidents have really been able to pull off the way that he did. It seems that if you look at presidential decision making, you could position each president on a spectrum from those who really prized a whole range of opinions, who wanted to encourage disagreement and contention, to others who really preferred yes men. Even in my own work on the 1960s, I think Kennedy was very much prone to freewheeling decision making, whereas LBJ really wanted to be surrounded by people who would mostly affirm his own instincts. Um, Is it possible to say which of those tendencies produces better policy, or is everything just dependent on the situation of the moment? Well, generally, presidents make better choices if they do not surround themselves with yes men. Uh, Social science actually bears this out for any type of leadership, whether it's a business or an organization. 
diverse groups are much more likely to avoid groupthink. They're much more likely to come up with creative solutions. And I think that speaks to businesses and CEOs and Fortune 500 companies as well as the presidency. That doesn't necessarily mean that the president has to have a ton of close advisors, but that the advisors need to be willing to tell them when they're wrong. And the presidents need to be willing to listen to those advisors, even if they're saying the thing that they don't necessarily want to hear. I think that's really the key to good presidential leadership, because no one is right all the time and no one has all the answers, especially for a country as powerful and big as the United States that includes so many different walks of life. It's impossible for one person to know all of those things. And so it's essential to have some different people around you, even if it's not a whole lot that can offer different information and push back when maybe you're being a little bit dense, which we all have those moments, mm -hmm. even if we are the president of the United States. Let me turn the question ar around about who was the most sure. successful president at managing a cabinet and ask you for your sense of who were the least successful in managing their cabinets. Well, in many ways, this is actually an easier question to answer because there are so many more of them. Um, in fact, I would argue that there are, you know, managing a cabinet is really, really hard. It's really hard work and it's more likely to fail than not. And there are a couple of different types of failures that we see. So one example, like James Madison, is a president who just kind of lets his cabinet run roughshod over his administration. He had a very limited concept of executive authority and his cabinet took advantage of it and they really undermined all of the policies and goals that he wanted to pursue. He also kind of was had the bad fortune to be stuck with the War of 1812 and he had a notion about how war should be fought that just didn't work. He didn't think the president should play a role and instead the secretary should do it, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So he had a terrible cabinet. Another example is of a president who, who surrounds himself with friends or cronies and then gives them way too much authority and delegates way too much power and doesn't maintain any oversight. So Warren G. Harding is a very good example of this. He filled his cabinet with friends from Ohio, many of whom happened to be horrifically corrupt, and he didn't really want to see that in them or believe that about them until it was really way too late. And the only reason he kind of avoided having to take responsibility is because he died unexpectedly. The last example is one that I would say Kennedy struggled with a bit, which is that if you don't have a clear sense of who is giving advice or you have multiple circles of advisors, that can be very confusing for the American people. It can be confusing for the executive branch. It can be confusing for those who are giving advice because it's not clear who's in power. Mm -hmm. I think that was something that Kennedy sometimes struggled with because he had a couple different groups of advisors. And as you said, he had a more freewheeling style that sometimes that lack of direction can really undermine an administration. Right. And what's striking about Kennedy, I suppose, is the reliance on a single cabinet member, namely his brother. And no doubt there are other instances like that across American history where the president really was relying most heavily on a single person with whom he had had a, a close relationship, presumably predating the presidency. Absolutely. I mean, and sometimes it, it can work out okay. You know, both Reagan and George H.W. Bush were very reliant on Jim Baker. And in some instances, that actually was, was not bad because he was a very dedicated public servant and a very experienced official and had been around for a really long time. In other instances, Woodrow Wilson was very reliant on Colonel House, who had been a friend and an advisor before the presidency, and I think really sort of helped direct Wilson's policy. And then once Wilson and the United States had joined World War I, he relied almost entirely on his wife. And while I think women can be, you know, very important advisors, I'm not sure that a president should only rely on their wife's advice, especially in a time of war. Yeah, but brief but fairly harsh comment toward the end of your book about Donald Trump. Where does he fit into the long history of presidents and their cabinets? Well, one of the things that there are two things that all presidents try to avoid in their cabinets, and these sound like very common sense things, but sometimes they can be more difficult to manage than than you would think. And the first is that presidents try and avoid unnecessary turnover. Anytime there's a new secretary coming into office, you're going to have a lag in that department's ability to function effectively. You're going to lose institutional knowledge there. It takes a while for a secretary to get up and running. 
So presidents really try and avoid that. And all presidents have some turnover, of course, especially if they serve two terms, because that's a very long time to be in these demanding jobs. But former President Trump had a unparalleled amount of turnover. And towards the end of his administration, he had mostly acting secretaries in many of the key positions. And that's really bad for the country because it means that the departments are not operating under maximum efficiency. It means that it's not always clear who is in charge. It means that maybe there are people who are pulling the strings and calling the shots that haven't been confirmed by the Senate and are supposed to be, which is against the law. So it can be very detrimental to the nation's security and the nation's prosperity. The second thing that presidents try to avoid is unnecessary scandal, which again, sounds like an obvious duh moment, but scandal takes away from the administration's ability to get things done. It takes away from the president's ability to focus. It draws attention and resources and time in the wrong direction. And so most presidents try to avoid it. Whereas former President Trump sometimes cultivated it himself. He would fire people on Twitter, which naturally is going to cause a scandal in the 21st century. So, and and these are not even necessarily judgments. These are just numbers and facts that show how he broke with the precedent of most of his predecessors in a way that I think most historians would argue would be detrimental to his presidency, the administration, and the nation. You mentioned a while ago that George Washington, back in the late 18th century, recognized the logic of appointing a cabinet that represented broadly the electorate. And it seems that over time, we see a striking tendency toward diversity of various types in the cabinet. And clearly, presidents have increasingly, as a general trend at least, prioritized this um, in making appointments. Where Where were the key milestones in that process, though? Talk about the first women who were appointed to the cabinet and other categories of Americans who were clearly not present for the first several decades of American history, but have gradually popped up in the cabinet and are now achieving um, rather impressive representation. Absolutely. So in some ways, cabinet membership and cabinet representation almost mirrors our definition of who counts as a citizen, of whose voice gets to be included in the political process. So Theodore Roosevelt was the first president to appoint a Jewish cabinet secretary. Frances Perkins was the first female cabinet secretary. She was the secretary of labor under Franklin D. Roosevelt, and I would argue is probably the most influential and impactful secretary of labor that the country has ever had. She's also the longest serving, which is really remarkable given how long he was in office. The first African-American secretary came under Lyndon B. Johnson. It was Robert Weaver, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. The first Asian-American secretary did not come until Norm Mineta was appointed under Bill Clinton's presidency. And his story is is a great example of why it's so important to have these different perspectives and voices. So Norm had served as a Secretary Mineta had served as a congressperson. He had been a businessman, but when he was a child, he had also been interned because he was Japanese American. Now he was born in the United States. He was an American citizen, but of course that didn't matter. What mattered was where his parents came from. And he didn't talk about that experience all of that much, but he was the secretary of transportation under George W. Bush. And after the attacks on 9-11, he was determined that that same sort of racial categorization of American citizens would not happen again. Mm. So he worked quite closely with George W. Bush to ensure that uh, Muslim Americans would not be targeted in, in that legal national way. He instructed the Federal Aviation Administration not to uh, racially stereotype Americans or travelers coming from the Middle East. He encouraged George W. Bush to make really important symbolic gestures that included Muslim Americans, including, of course, the visit to the community center near and the mosque near um, the site of the 9-11 attacks. And he was pretty vocal that it was important that these same things didn't happen again. Now, if his voice hadn't been included in the cabinet, it's hard to say exactly if that would have been different. It would have developed in a different way. 
but it demonstrates that there is this real need to have all the different types of experiences in the American life represented in the administration. It's quite remarkable that the first woman wasn't appointed to the cabinet, as you say, until the 1930s. Uh, but here we are in 2022, and the Biden administration has uh, hit unprecedented levels with the appointment of women to the cabinet. In fact, in an article that you wrote from Ms. Magazine, you say that we've now hit what you call gender parity in the cabinet, but not gender equality. Talk a little bit about that distinction. Well, first, I do want to commend President Biden for putting together what has been thus far the most diverse cabinet in U.S. history and included a lot of voices, including the first Native American secretary, which I think are essential and beneficial. And I think his presidency and his administration has benefited from those voices. It's no secret that certain cabinet secretaries have more power than others. Certain departments are more, you know, serious, quote unquote, serious and Uh, more influential than others. These tend to be things like the Secretary of Treasury, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, Secretary, um, or excuse me, the Director of National Intelligence, uh, these types of positions. And President Biden does have women in some of those positions, but there have yet to been, there have yet to have been female secretaries in some of the more defense and military positions. And that's incredibly important for a couple of reasons. One, The military does still continue to struggle with representation among the different genders. It continues to struggle with issues of um, assault and how women are treated in the ranks. This is something they're very open about and they are trying to combat. And that's really important. But having leadership at the highest levels is a really important way to demonstrate that women, too, can serve in these positions. Same with, um, you know, the attorney general, same with... um, the CIA director, things, th- these positions that are considered to be among the most serious. And so I fully expect that at some point Biden will have some cabinet transitions. He will have people that cycle out. That's very normal, especially if he were to win a second term. And I would hope he would take the opportunity to include more voices in some of those spaces just to demonstrate that one's gender or one's race isn't necessarily a determiner if they can be in one of these very powerful, important positions. How does the United States compare to other democracies in the appointment of women, or for that matter, other underrepresented groups in these powerful positions alongside the head of state? Well, in in some respects, we are doing fairly well. So for example, um, the Japanese, the new Japanese prime minister, has talked about the challenges that Japan has faced with lack of diversity in its cabinet. And that's something that he's actually received some criticism from. Yet most of the democratic nations around the world, even if they're not necessarily straight democracies, if they're democratic monarchies, if they are socialist democracies, have had a female head of state. And that is obviously something we have not done as a country yet. So we are one of the few that have not yet reached that milestone. And I think it's one of the last and very important milestones that we at some point do achieve. George Washington, a long time ago, seems to have recognized that he could consolidate his authority, make his authority more plausible to more Americans by making shrewd appointments. Would you say that American presidents in the 21st century recognize that logic and have proceeded in the same way? For the most part, yes. There are, of course, exceptions. And there have been moments where there's been some retrenchment in terms of representation in the cabinet and in administrations. But I think most presidents understand the value, even if we're thinking about this from a purely calculating perspective. It is beneficial to them to make sure that all the different parts of their coalition are represented. And especially if a president represents a broad coalition, that's going to include a lot of different racial, gender, ethnic, religious, education, minorities, and uh, communities. And so it makes sense for them to welcome all of those people into the administration because it increases their buy-in and their Hmm. willingness to support the new administration. So even if they don't believe it is the right thing to do morally or based on virtue, It is certainly the right thing to do politically. And I think that most politicians recognize the opportunity in those choices and are quick to seize on that what is a relatively easy win 
Well, Dr. Lindsay Travinsky, thank you so much for this fascinating discussion of a subject that probably doesn't get as much attention as it deserves for all the reasons that you've uh, elucidated so eloquently this afternoon. Thank you again for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. This was really great fun. My thanks to our sponsors, the Moody Foundation and St. David's Healthcare, and as always to you for joining us. If you've enjoyed this episode, subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm Mark Lawrence. See you next time.